and the pastoral civilizations that are devoted to the great goddess retreat behind high walls. In, in 6500 BC, these chariot people sweep down and they destroy Chatal Yuyuk. That ends it. That ends the goddess, the great goddess, as the unchallenged icon of the human image of the sacred in the Middle East. Now, there are a series of goddesses then, but progressively through time, their consort becomes more and more important. And then, by the time you get to the to what we were, t- what I was taught in school, were the great early civilizations: Sumer, Ur, Chaldea, Babylon, and Egypt. By the time you get to those civilizations, it's a total ego trip. A god king. Uh, everybody has hierarchically oriented themselves toward the ruler, who is the visible manifestation of God. He owns everything and it's always a he so what has happened here is that in the absence of the mushroom agriculture rather than pastoralism city building rather than nomadism and the aggrandizement of the ego have put themselves in place and then the uh, the last remnants of Chatal go to uh, Minoan Crete where they carry on for a few millennia a unique islanded uh, partnership society but what's going on throughout the rest of the world is this ego uh, male dominator style of which we are the inheritors and the perfectors because there are other wrinkles which come along through time. This clash between these wheeled chariot vehicle people and these pastoralists creates then the Indo-European amalgam, which is the inspiration for the Avestan literature, the inspiration for the Rig Vedas. And what I want to say is that at this point begins a frantic search for substitutes for the original connection to the goddess. And what also begins is the sense of abandonment, the sense of existential embeddedness in history, the sense of loss of control. And plants like Amanita muscaria, Wasson's candidate for Soma, Pagamon harmala, David Flattery's uh, candidate for Soma, this book that I asked Cameron to look at, some of the rest of you may be interested. This is the most recent important book about drugs to be published. It's called Hauma and Harmaline, and it's by David Flattery. It's middle it's Near Eastern Studies publication number twenty one. You can order it from UC Press on your credit card if you need a a copy, and it will argue that Soma was not Amanita muscaria, that it was Pergamon harmala, and it makes a strong case. I mean, I regard now the whole question as totally reopened. Gordon Wasson was a, a lovely person and a great explorer, and his accomplishments in the Oaxacan Highlands uh, can never be uh, gainsaid or naysaid. But he was slightly overeager on this Amanita muscaria business. Uh, throughout the world, this dominator model triumphed. The only place where it didn't triumph uh, in our cultural, in the th- threads that lead into our cultural uh, heritage, was in Minoan Crete. And in Minoan Crete, The mysteries continue to be practiced, but over thousands of years, it retreated into ritual and then mere symbol. One of the peculiar features of Minoan religion is what is called pillar worship, the aniconic pillar that occurs in the center of every Minoan shrine, I believe, is the aniconic image of the mushroom in the same way that the Shiva Lingam, 
becomes an aniconic image of the male sexual organ, the, the aniconic image in Minoan religion is an image of the mushroom. In the late phase of Minoan religion, there is no question that opium was the drug of choice. And in fact, the linear, the, the linear B tablets that Michael Ventris deciphered, they couldn't believe their eyes when they saw what the scale of the opium production. Well, if you know anything about opium and junk, you know it is, it is uh, what you take for pain cultural pain, group pain, personal pain. The drugging of late Minoan culture is, I believe, a response to the slow death of the partnership society. Even at that, it is from Minoan religion that the mystical wellsprings of Greek religion spring. The, the pantheon of the Thracian Greeks they were pretty hard-headed types. Uh, the, the mystical element in Greek religion, the Orphic element, the Dionysian element, the uh, celebration of Persephone and Demeter and all of that, those are Minoan threads brought in to uh, Greek religion. And that's the last time that in our cultural line of development that there was access to uh, the uh, mystical tremendum. Uh, Wasson made an interesting case that what was used at Eleusis was ergotized beer. As you know, ergot is a smut that can grow on domesticated grains. And ergotized beer would be heavy with... Um, LSD-like alkaloids. As I read Wasson's work to write this book for Bantam, I, I was frustrated. Why, if you believe ergotized beer was the mystery of Eleusis, why don't you brew some ergotized beer and take it? And the answer is, I think that this would be pretty scary. Eleusis operated for 2,000 years. Every September, several thousand people were exposed to the mystery in an inner sanctum called the Telesterion. I find it hard to believe that you could give ergot beer to a couple of thousand people once a year and not have the mystery get a certain reputation for being dangerous because ergot is dangerous. If you, uh, you know, in the Middle Ages, there were outbreaks of ergot-infected rye. In fact, there was one outbreak in France in the 1100s where several thousand people died. Well, now there are arguments to this, and people can say, well, there must have been a strain of ergot that produced psychedelic alkaloids in great quantity and didn't produce uh, uh, toxins very much. Can anybody come up with a strain of claviceps? This is ergot. Can anybody come up with a strain that won't kill you if you miss the mark? He talks about it, but they, don't, they never got down to uh, the acid test. You know, they never brewed it up and did it. Now, uh, Robert Graves who was the guy who turned the Wassons on to the idea of going to Mexico to look for mushrooms, he had an entirely different idea, which Wasson mysteriously fails to even mention in his book on Eleusis. I think he should have at least uh, denounced the guy's position and showed what was wrong with it. What Graves argued was, he said, at these mystery sites, they're always drinking something. And they always publish the recipe of what they're drinking. And the ingredients are always the same. Water, rye, sugar, a couple of other things. And he said uh, that this recipe was an augum. Do you know what an augum is? An augum is where you have a list and the first letter of each item in the list spells a word. It's an old Irish trick, uh, and it's a mnemonic trick. 
he said that the recipes for ergot were an augum. And if you arranged the ingredients, you could always spell the Greek word mikos, mushrooms. So he said, you know, all this stuff about barley and all that, that's just nonsense. They were eating mushrooms. Evidence is thin, but there is some evidence. In A.B. Cook's book, Zeus, there's a picture of Triptolemius, who is a figure in the Demeter Mysteries, holding what seems very clearly to be a mushroom. Of course, the mushroom has a phallic aspect, and you do get disembodied phalli, both in Greek and Roman art, so if it's you know, it's ambiguous. You can't tell. Is this a, a autonomous male member running around or is this a small pointed cap mushroom? Uh, in any case, whatever was being done at Eleusis, that is uh, the last contact we had with the mystery. And by that time, opium uh, was a a drug that was used in the ancient world. We view opium as virulently addicting. However, it wasn't noticed that opium was addicting until 1600 when John Playfair, in a, a book of his, mentioned the addiction syndrome. It was used for 3,000 years with nobody noticing that you could get hooked on opium. So the virulence of the addiction is somewhat overstated. I mean, I myself have smoked opium many days and weeks in succession and then gotten on an airplane and flown to some benighted country where they didn't have opium, and it was no problem. I mean, you just forget it. Addiction uh, to natural substances, with the exception of tobacco, is, is uh, something you really have to work at. Um, but the abandonment of this partnership society in Africa set us up with a longing, an itch that we have to scratch. And this is why we are the addictive creatures that we are. Why I said last night we are the children of a dysfunctional relationship to the past. We were literally torn from the bosom of a relationship that held down pathology in our species because the ego is a pathological state, extreme ego inflation. Once the uh, medication was withdrawn, once the plant was no longer accessible, we developed all kinds of substitutes and all kinds of neurotic expressions of this situation of incompleteness that we feel in ourselves. And this has gone on until the present day. Uh, I can talk some about that this afternoon, the way in which, for instance, uh, the fermentation of fruit juices and of honey to make mead created the alternate path of alcoholic intoxication but you see, beers and wines can never be more than 17% alcohol by volume because when a fermentation process reaches 17% alcohol, the alcohol kills the organism that is doing the fermentation. So unless you have a technique for distilling alcohol, you cannot make it stronger than 17%. Well, we don't know exactly. There seem to be notable exceptions to this where we don't quite understand what's happening. For instance, the Roman historian Pliny describes Roman wines so strong that when they were thrown onto fires, they burned. This seems to indicate some kind of distillation process. And it has been speculated that with a simple bell-shaped apparatus, you could put wool in the top of it and very laboriously wring distilled alcohol out of wool. But the standard method of putting it into a condenser to get it out was not developed until an alchemist, Raymond Lull, uh, figured this out. 
in the 15th century and or in the uh, 14th century once he had figured it out Lull believed that he had discovered the alchemical elixir of life he be- he on the basis of his invention of distilled alcohol and his drinking of a large amount of it he <laughs> proclaimed the eminent end of the world he felt that you know when you have dope this good can Christ be far behind <laughs> And he urged other people, uh, uh, friends of his, alchemical colleagues, to also experiment with this, uh, which they did very successfully. And this is the basis for the cordials and the brandies and all of this stuff that we're familiar with. There is something really insidious about synthetic drugs, about concentrating Uh, what is a a vegetable essence and very diffuse. Opium was no problem until morphine came along. Morphine uh, appears hardly a problem in the context of heroin. Heroin was invented to cure morphine addiction. That was the idea with it. Coca, as you know, has been used for thousands and thousands of years without a problem. Cocaine uh, very quickly develops into a problem. The enthusiasts of cocaine in the 19th century, Freud and his school, uh, were riding on the great wave of optimism about cocaine that clustered around it when it was found to be a local anesthetic. Uh, The other thing is peculiar routes of administration have been created. The enema is a natural route of administration that was created by Amazonian Indians thousands of years ago because they had rubber and they figured out that you know they could avoid vomiting and toxicity by using enemas. The hypodermic syringe was invented in 1856 just a few years after the invention of morphine and just in time for the American Civil War and the Franco-Prussian War, just in time to inject a lot of morphine into wounded soldiers and then release them into the American and European population as morphine addicts. That was the beginning of that. It came out of the simultaneous wars on two continents. Uh, Coming into the 20th century, uh, amphetamines were invented in the late 19th century, all of these synthetics, and they seem to push our buttons in a way that these natural compounds don't do, and you get serious addiction syndromes, especially when you use these new routes of administration. Well, simultaneously, with all this development in pharmacology coming out of German successes in molecular chemistry in the 19th century, a vast amount of ethnographic data is being collected. The modern science of of, uh, mythology and anthropology is born. So, in the 20th century, uh, we suddenly get a huge amount of anthropological data about strange plants being used by strange people in far-off corners of the world. Uh, Mescaline becomes very interesting to uh, uh, Krapelin and uh, Havelock Ellis and um, uh, Kluver, all of these people. Um, In the 30s, 40s, and 50s, the mushroom story slowly breaks. Uh, Albert Hoffman invents LSD. It doesn't really make itself known in the scientific literature until the late 40s. A very interesting thing about our particular area of interest that astonished me all the talking I've been doing about it is the brevity of the window of research Uh, what I'm particularly interested in are the indole hallucinogens ibogaine is an indole hallucinogen it wasn't known before 1850 
It wasn't characterized by the turn of the century. It has never had any vogue as a social drug in the United States. It has never been used significantly in psychotherapy. No human studies have ever been done on it. That's Ibogaine. LSD, the one member of the family that got a lot of attention, it was not announced in the scientific literature until 1947. By 1967, it was illegal to do human studies on it in the United States. That's a 20-year window, and that was the longest window any of these things ever got. Uh, psilocybin was characterized by Hoffman in 55, I believe. By 67, it was illegal. Um, DMT was discovered by the Czech chemist Sara in 56. By 66, it was illegal. And the amount of human studies that had been done in that time were very brief. So one of the ideas that I think we have to disabuse ourselves of is that science knows anything about these things. The human studies were never done. I was talking to somebody who was involved in all this stuff the other day, and they were telling me they got a protocol to study LSD. They were going to have a hundred subjects. It was a big project. Uh, set and setting was under control. It was being run by sensitive, psychedelic people. It wasn't the white coat and clipboard set. It was all set to begin on Monday morning. Saturday afternoon, Art Linkletter's daughter takes LSD and drowns herself in a swimming pool. By Monday morning, the LSD project was dead in the water. So uh, this thing, we may, you may have the notion that we are a minority that feels this is important and there is a majority that feels that it's unimportant. That isn't the case. We are a minority who feels this Im is important, and there is a majority that knows nothing about it whatsoever, has no data, and no uh, realization of what it is. An interesting case, an interesting example of how science misses the boat. I'll tell this story, and then I'll let you go. Um, DMT is a very powerful, short-acting hallucinogen, the most powerful. We'll talk more about it in terms of its content, but what I want to refer to here is you smoke DMT. This is how you do it. This is how everybody does it. Now, it can be shot, but, you know, I, I think that's really a barrier. That's something. I don't think you should shoot anything. Uh, because I just think, you know, it's a way of transmitting diseases. It sets a funny psychology toward the integrity of your own body. And it's just a kind of bad habit to get into. Nevertheless, scientists love to inject things into people. They love the injection. Why do they love it? Well, aside from the fact that you get to stick somebody, the reason they love it is because you can absolutely control the dose. You see the barrel of the syringe. You see that there's 30 milligrams of X there. You watch it go into the muscle, and you write in your clipboard, 30 milligrams I am. What they object to about smoking is you can't be sure that the person got the whole dose. You can't be sure that the whole dose crossed the blood-brain barrier. You can't be sure. Nevertheless, this is how people do DMT. Funny thing is, when you shoot DMT, it's not as impressive. It's slower to come on. It's slower to come away from. It lasts about 45 minutes, and it's a low hill, not this mind-shattering spike of activity that drops you down. So if you look up uh, dimethyltryptamine in Goodman and Gilman or the Merck Index or, you know, the physician, whatever, um, it will say short-acting hallucinogen, 45 minutes to one hour in duration. 
This is not what DMT is at all. DMT lasts uh, 7 to 12 minutes and is spectacular. Well, finally now, a project is getting started to study DMT where the people will actually do it the way human beings do it. For the first time, science will lower itself to administering a drug in the manner in which it is actually used by the user in society. But it's taken 30 years to get them to understand something that simple. So uh, what this means is that people such as ourselves, we are the cutting edge of neuropsychopharmacology because uh, the content is the frontier and these scientist types know very little about it. I mean, occasionally the most daring of them will take a trip, but the great names that you associate with the psychedelic uh, movement with certain notable exceptions, are fairly cautious users. I mean, people who have their names written all over this stuff, when you actually pin them down, they say, well, I took psilocybin four times, and uh, I took his X and Y a few times. This doesn't... It's not to take it and prove that you can survive it. It's to take it and embrace it and be part of it. So... Science must stand aside unless it's willing to get its feet wet. This still belongs to courageous individuals uh, who are willing to put their body-mind system on the line and then draw conclusions from it. So in trying to inspire you to do research, to think about ways in which whatever your specialty, if you're a medical researcher, a neurophysiologist, a therapist, a chemist, an anthropologist, a linguist, whatever you are, uh, don't be in awe of science. Science has nothing to say here. Science is a puppy dog lagging behind the train. This is an issue where the people are forcing uh, the focus. Well, I think that's enough. The time slipped by. You weren't violent enough in insisting on interrupting and asking questions. Uh, We'll go through more of this. This is the basic notion that I want to put across, that a... A disturbed symbiosis in prehistory is what makes the hallucinogen so important in the present because now, knowing what we know, we can restore that symbiosis. We can take up where we left off at Eleusis, at Chatal Huyuk, and at Jericho. We can reclaim what has been lost since Eden. We'll meet here at four. Thank you. Okay. Is it working for you, Paul? Well, this morning I made sort of a um, three-dimensional, rational argument from anthropological and archaeological and pharmacological data toward trying to convince the listener that uh, hallucinogens were involved in the origins of human consciousness, that behind the abandonment of that lies our neurotic relationship to nature and so forth. So it was like a an analysis of the phenomenon of millennia of hallucinogenic drug taking and then millennia of being away from it. What I thought might be, uh, this is sort of the case that we have to make to our critics. This is the information that has to be marshaled and argued from if we are serious about a psychedelic theory of the origin of consciousness. But what I thought it might be interesting to talk about uh, this afternoon is something which is, I think, dearer probably to each of us as an individual, which is 
just maybe to talk a little about the actual phenomenology of these states and what seems to be going on there. Uh, in writing this book that I've been working on, I've seen how the image of the unconscious perceived through drugs has been, it's like an archetype that has been evolving over at least uh, three or four hundred years. And the strong formative influence on the archetype of the psychedelic in, uh, experience comes from two directions. It comes from the hashish vision and the opium dream. These are the two sources of pre-20th century psychedelic insight that the Western mind had access to. Well, the, uh, for reasons too complex to go into here, hashish did not have a vogue in Europe the way opium did. It was left for Americans to seriously explore hashish as a vehicle for visionary hallucination, specifically Bayard Taylor, who in a book called In the Lands of the Saracen wrote a marvelous account of eating hashish in Damascus in 1840. I mean, it's just a scream. Uh, and, of course, the irreproachable Fitzhugh Ludlow, who ate hashish and attended Yale uh, teas for young ladies as a freshman at Yale in 1853 and describes having to excuse himself from various uh, faculty student functions when, as he puts it, the wallpaper began to crawl and Chinese mandarins burst from the umbrella stand. <laughs> then I made my departure, lest I betray myself. <laughs> the earliest recorded instance of someone concerned about losing their cool. Uh, but the stronger of these two currents of thought was the opium dream. And the opium dream uh, laudanum was tincture of opium, an alcoholic uh, extract of opium. And everybody was into this stuff from about 1795 through much of the 18th century. Uh, not only the great names associated with it, Coleridge and De Quincey, but Byron and Shelley, all of these people dabbled in opium. Well, what comes out of the English romantic imagination's contact with the reveries of opium is uh, a world of desolated ruins and pale women wailing beneath a demon moon and black oceans sucking at crumbling rock where mordant vegetation tumbles down to storm-whipped shores, right? This is the romantic imagination. It, and it has this morbid stillness the stillness of Morphia, the stillness of the god of dreams. And this influences the Gothic conception in literature, so forth and so on. Uh, when uh, this thing about the history of, uh, of how people image drugs and drug states reminds me, I will digress briefly, of a thing that happened to me that always amused me. Uh, I was on an ocean liner headed for the Seychelles from India in 1969, and we were furiously smoking hash, smuggling hash, eating hash, and there was a South African mercenary on this boat, and he didn't know anything about cannabis, but he was very interested. And so he was questioning me about, uh, about hashish. And he asked this wonderful question. He said, Is it like a seance? Sort of. 
this question told me a great deal about him and didn't give me a lot of hope that he would turn into a hardened hash head. So, see, what this is saying is that our images of the transcendental realm that we inherit from the past inevitably color whatever manifestation of it we encounter in the future. So for him, the transcendental realm meant table-tapping parties that his mother used to hold in Jayburg. So this prompted the question, is it like a seance? So you levitate instead of a table. That's right. <laughs> So, uh, coming into the 20th century, that was it, the hashish and the opium thing. Well, then uh, Freud and behind him Jung began to look at the products of pathological fantasy and the products of folklore and uh, alchemy and the... uh, aroused imagination in its many manifestations in religion and shamanism, and they proposed then there was a widening of the notion of this other realm. And uh, the as LSD was developed, this was what was behind, this was what was in the minds of most of the people who were dealing with LSD. They saw it as a searchlight that could be turned on to illuminate the dark regions of the unconscious. And I suppose if you were Freudian and you used LSD, you searched for Oedipal traces and you know, all this stuff. And if you were a Jungian, you were seeing alchemical motifs and transformative motifs drawn from uh, folklore and that sort of thing. Well, this worked for LSD for reasons that we maybe don't have to talk about. Uh, my take on it would be that it, it has... Uh, LSD is like a mirror. It's like a perfect mirror. It magnifies whatever is held up before it. But it, unlike these, some of these other indole hallucinogens, which are, you know, demagogic, in their wish to convey information. I mean, LSD is like perfect mind, perfect mirror, and the mushroom is like a street corner preacher who's just haranguing you with some visionary epic. So uh, LSD was a fortuitous or a synchronistically uh, important choice then because it confirmed that Freudian and Jungian expectation and they reported remarkable success with the treatment of neurosis and so on. Uh, What then came on after the uh, all of these things were made illegal in the 70s was a much larger population began to be exposed to psilocybin, not to psilocybin, the compound, but to mushrooms. And it's a very interesting point that the people who who took psilocybin around the Harvard psilocybin project in the in the sixties were completely unprepared for the difference between that and fresh mushrooms. The difference is considerable, and there is no rational reason from a scientific point of view why this should be. So it's confounding. Uh, Psilocybin and the mushroom should be the same thing. Otherwise, you must be a mystic of some sort because you're hypothesizing that, you know, there's something better about the mushroom. Nevertheless, this seems to be experientially confirmable so that the establishment picture of psilocybin was flawed in the literature. In fact, the literature of hallucinogenic drugs up to 1970, let's see, all revolves around the notion that hallucinogenic drugs are more or less like LSD, last half as long as LSD or twice as long as LSD, 
it's all measured against this. They were completely infatuated for some reason with LSD, as was the entire culture, probably from the pharmacological point of view, because it was active in the nanogram range, in the range of millionths of a gram. This is still, to this day, astonishing uh, that any drug should be active in the nanogram range and that a hallucina uh, hallucinogen should be active, for me, confirms the quantum mechanical connection of consciousness because, you know, so little matter is in play in that situation where you take 500 gamma, you know, one five thousandth of a gram. Uh, it's pretty amazing. So uh, the official version of what can happen with these hallucinogens is very limited. And uh, there was never stress on content. The individual content of the psychedelic trip was treated at, like the ravings of a psychotic. In other words, it was never examined from the point of view that this person might actually be a reliable witness. If you read the literature of what psychedelic drugs do, like if you read a book like Hoffer and ha Osmond's book, Hallucinogens, classic in the field, you will get the idea that what these drugs do is they cause uh, pictures b to before the eyes, colored shapes, moving grids, lattices, spontaneous laughter, uh, confusion, anxiety, and hysteria. This is the range. What they're not telling you is what it feels like to be in a situation where you experience spontaneous laughter, anxiety, little pictures, and hysteria all at once, you see. I mean, it's a, con it, it's a uh, complete dis dissolving of your personality, of the boundary constraints, everything. And, then, and so then what was offered after Freud and Jung by Aldous Huxley and people like that to model it was some kind of confirmation of Eastern philosophy. It was embraced that way. And it was said that we should read Meister Eckhart and the Upanishads, particularly the Mandukya Upanishad, and that we should sleep with the Tibetan Book of the Dead at our elbow, and that a lot of thought given to ego loss and the white light and this kind of thing. Well, um, this now, to me, seems fairly superficial. In a way, it spawned a whole renaissance in Far Eastern studies, but those people are not very psychedelic. And the people who used those metaphors seem not to be present in the field anymore. Uh, the, so then in the 70s, I tried to launch a meme based around the idea that these things were extraterrestrial pheromones, that they were, in fact, highly engineered message units from intelligent species that, by some strategy, had penetrated this sector of the space-time cosmos with a technology that allowed them to essentially engineer a virus-like, information-bearing, biomechanical device which could be bled into the ecology of a planet and would summon out of that planet intelligent organization after a million years or so. And I'm still not entirely uncomfortable with this idea. I mean, there are reasons to wonder. Uh, more recently, a counter-meme has come forward that offers another possibility. That is that uh, somehow the planet itself is an organized entelechy and that somehow we are within the, the geocognitive field of some kind of planetary mind that is orchestrating history well, now notice what these two theories have in common, the Gaian mind theory 
and uh, the extraterrestrial intervention theory. They are theories that come forward out of a need to account for the presence in the psychedelic experience. This is not something that LSD ever talked much about. If people were encountering aliens, they were doing so in a highly idiosyncratic and non-repeatable way. The, I don't think the flying saucer was a serious part of the original Haight-Ashbury ethos, you know. I think the, the unicorn and the rainbow, but the flying saucer was a later understanding. It arose in the mid-70s with the mushrooms. I mean, it would be interesting to trace the evolution of these motifs. You know, the butterfly was in there too as a kind of unconscious understanding of metamorphosis. But what the extraterrestrial theory and the guy and mind theory are both trying to come to grips with that neither the Freudian nor the Jungian nor, any, nor the Romantic theory needed to take much account of is the presence of the alien mind. What is this? Well, I'm not sure. I think this is really the question for high-dose uh, Trekkies to uh, put to themselves. You know, why does it have... Why is the human mind haunted? This is a way to put it. Why, when we go in there, are there these information-bearing, unbelievably peculiar, familiar, yet alien, uh, hyperdimensional creatures? What are they? Uh, you know, several possibilities have been kicked around over the years. Are they uh, a state of human development in the far-flung future that is working with some kind of psychotronic technology to communicate with the ultra-primitives of the 20th century through some kind of, you know... I mean, this is possible, but somewhat labored, I think. Are they extraterrestrials able by, via, again, some unimaginable psychotronic technology to tear open a, a mental dimension in which they can communicate with us? Uh, well, I don't know. Are they uh, another possibility that, you know, has a certain kind of eerie charm? is that they are uh, the grateful dead, if you will. They are the dead. It's interesting how much shamanism worldwide focuses on the notion that shamans come and go from the land of the dead. Is there an ecology of souls in hyperspace that you can perceive for four and a half minutes on DMT and then the barrier between that dimension and this dimension closes over. I confess this idea, maybe because it's recent, has a certain attraction to me. It, I know I'm warm when I have the, oh no, it couldn't possibly be that response, <laughs> which I have very strongly to this idea. It's like it boggles my mind to think that, that because it's heart, 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 it's not, it doesn't take heart to face the extraterrestrials, you know. You become Captain James Kirk of the Enterprise and you move toward this diplomatic rendezvous. But the th idea that it might be your dead family and that, in fact, what you are seeing is what you will become and that, in fact, this is an intimation of your personal immortality is just, you know hair raising <laughs> and as someone pointed out uh, you know hair raising is the quality that Robert Graves associates with the near approach of Leucothea Leucothea is the white goddess the white goddess is the goddess of uh, death many many people come out of the DMT place and say you know it feels like death. 
there's something about it. Yes, it does. It does. It feels like more than death. It feels... I had this trip recently which really alarmed me. It was... Oh, wow. There was some kind of compression going on and this sense of slippage. And I came out in... uh, the, in this in the parlor of my grandfather's house in a certain sunlit afternoon in 1948 and I was in my child's body and I was facing my my circus my little circus of figures that I had and I had little tigers in cages where when you move the bars this way, it's a tiger. When you move it this way, it's a lion. And I had all this stuff. And I was there, and then I was there, and I knew it was just freakish, beyond belief. And other people have said about DMT that you only have one trip on it, and you go to it again and again, and it's a stitch in time. It sews it all together, and you flow back through these places but the feeling of not death exactly but just the skewedness of it all what was happening to time and space and mentality and association and my psychic relationship to all these intervening events I mean it felt like time travel it felt like the real thing I would hate to have it be more real than that um in contrast to the ordinary DMT flash, where what happens is you break into this space where these things are that I've sort of facetiously called the tykes. The tykes are these childlike, self-transforming, jeweled basketballs that run around you and jump through you and are like autonomous portions of the surface of your own psyche or something. I mean, you can't tell what is going on except that they are offering these things which are like toys or machines. They're like these Chinese ivory balls that are carved with many levels. That And you look at these things and the immediate emotion is astonishment bordering on heart attack and then they just take it away and then they show you another one and they're showing you this stuff and trying to convey something well after having this experience a number of times I came to the conclusion which again was shocking to me that this is somebody's idea of an environment that is reassuring to human beings. This is the equivalent of a playpen where you hang brightly colored plastic things above the crib so that the baby will hit at them and learn hand and eye coordination. So that when you come through into this place and there's the elf hooray, which is the thing which greets you as you come through, there's this yay and then they have you and they say okay now we have you okay don't freak out don't be amazed pay attention look at this look at this look at this and you're just saying you know what happened a minute ago I was somewhere we were talking about a drug we were thinking of doing it somebody had a match now what is happening and they're saying forget about that Look at this, look at this. And they're singing in this rhyming language which you see. You do not hear it, you see it. The entire geometry of the space in which you're in is conformational syntax that is contorting itself through these fractal regressions. There's no time, there's no space. These things keep moving in and out of your body. They keep telling you they love you. They keep telling you to pay attention, to remember, to remember, to remember. And at that point, you're just falling out of it, falling backward. Everything melts, everything collapses, everything turns to slush, it falls away. There's eidetic revisionism and you're 
and then you can't remember. <laughs> and you say, what happened? You know, what happened? It, it's not like being... It's like being struck by lightning. It's like what this room would be like if a fighter plane came through the roof. It's that all hell breaks out for like three and a half minutes and you cannot make any sense whatsoever of it. You cannot correlate it to a drug. A drug? Are you kidding? The other thing is it hasn't affected you. You are yourself. You are saying, you know, holy shit, what is this? You're not blurred. You don't have all kinds of problems. You're just... But what has happened is the sensory input has gone hyperspatial, 100%, just zing, and there you are. And uh, this doesn't fit into any of these models about the cheerful probing of the layers of the unconscious, racial or personal. This is a breakthrough into some kind of parallel continuum somewhere, somehow, that is so beyond the paradigm of, of the cheerful men in white coats who run our world that it just absolutely, as I said, makes your hair stand on end. This is repeatable. This is not, I'm not leading a flying saucer cult where we wait in cornfields with high hopes. All you have to do is have the guts to, you know, push the button and the floor you're sitting on will disappear and you will fall through into this place. How do they keep the lid on this stuff? This is what lies behind this cheerful historical recitation of argument this morning, that the human world is tangential to some kind of appalling mystery, unexpected, not even clear that this has anything to do with spirit and love and being good or any of that. It's just some kind of weird thing that our languages, our culture, our religion, our perceptual biases have caused us to not see, not see at all. And so then we've constructed a fantasy world, a world based on empiricism, three-dimensional linear rationalism, and above all, a world constructed on not getting stoned. They say, you know, just stay away from that. That is the edge of the world. There, there be dragons. They're right. They're right. We are no smarter than uh, the people of 13th century Europe who feared to sail west because they knew that the edge of the world lay there. I mean, the edge of our world, the defeat of the scientific paradigm, the absolute confounding of a thousand years of rational philosophy and science is experientially available to every one of us but for flimsy laws. Flimsy laws, again, made by men who wear dresses. Wherever there's bad stuff being done, these guys wearing dresses are to be found highly active. Why is this? Why is this? The church and the judiciary are, you know, in this weird lock on the evolution of the human mind. It has to do with new ideas. New ideas are bad news if you're a control freak. They spell trouble, some kind of trouble. And it doesn't even matter what kind of new ideas. I mean, to the Roman Catholic Church, Protestants loomed like, uh, you know, a psychedelic revolution. The notion that people should seek in their own hearts for guidance from God. What kind of heresy is this? You know, this is what we have the church fathers for. This is what we have ecclesiastical councils, great universities. God's ways are obscure. The unaided human individual, uneducated, cannot be expected to know God's ways. We will explain it to you. Well, Protestantism then was, you know, the the cutting edge of something happening. Now, a somewhat different situation prevails. Each thing, you know, becomes its own antithesis. Uh, Each thing kills the thing it loves. So... uh, 
what needs to be central in thinking about this, I think, is how unassimilatable it is, how very, very different it is to be stoned on DMT than it is to be sitting here in a room full of people talking about it, that it's different, lots different. It's not, there's nothing else in our spectrum of potential experiences that can come close to it. Well, now, DMT is interesting. Uh, it occurs in the human brain. Naturally, every single one of us is holding. The law has not yet dealt with this. But it, it, the fact of the matter is, you know, that we are elaborating DMT in our brains. Why? We don't know. What does it mean that the most powerful of all hallucinogens occurs naturally in the human brain? What does it mean that the most powerful of all natural hallucinogens is the shortest acting. Because you see, the speed of recovery is a measure of the toxicity of a drug. A drug or a compound or a plant that you can feel 24 hours or 48 hours later is toxic. That's what that feeling is. If you have to you know, lie around the day after a trip, this is because there was a toxic, uh, a trailing toxic edge to whatever you did. DMT, you are returned to the baseline of consciousness within 7 to 20 minutes, unfailingly. Well, this means then that the human brain is completely set up to... Uh, degrade, depotentiate, deanimate, dealkylate this compound and shunt it into harmless byproducts like indolacetic acid. It means that the brain is familiar with this, has many pathways to deal with it and can degrade it quickly. So that's an argument for safety. Well, this is beginning to work us into a corner. Here's what we're having to face that the strongest hallucinogen is the shortest acting hallucinogen, is the safest hallucinogen, and is the most natural of all hallucinogens. The reasons for not doing it are just disappearing right and left, and yet it remains an absolutely taboo aspect of even the psychedelic culture because it... Uh, succeeds where all else fails and it raises questions that are not psychological that are not philosophical it, it seems to imply that our entire model of the world is not slightly flawed but absolute baloney that we are living in a dream, we are living in some kind of one-dimensional surface of some hyper-dimensional object, and a questions like, is there life after death? Are there extraterrestrial intelligences in the universe? What is the meaning of human history? Who am I? All of this is a product of lower-dimensional language, unable to conceive of this object which we are now in a position to explore. This is some kind of thing which we are discovering. It's, the, it's so large a discovery that it takes a century or so to even figure out what this is. I mean, while we're dredging the Bermuda Triangle for flying saucers, <laughs> while we're training our radio telescopes on Zeta Reticuli, while we're doing all this stuff, looking for the message, the message is exactly where you would expect to find it, present in the human mind as the transmission of some kind of entity for which the laws of physics and the confines of matter mean nothing. And life and death seem to be nothing. Uh, two or three centuries ago, this would have just simply been called God Almighty. 
Uh, I don't know. I don't think that it is the God that hung the stars like lamps in heaven. That is a very large God. The stars are vast. But something is going on on this planet around the issue of biology. Something has broken through here. Some kind of higher order organizational process is in play that is larger than the human species, larger than the historical damage we have done to the planet. Something is going on. And I think that we are reaching the cultural stage where if we can sufficiently decondition, we can understand what it is. It's something about the biological integrity of the planet and cognition and ourselves as instruments of something that wants to manifest itself through the release of energy and the control of matter in some form. I mean, it's not clear whether we are preparing to build spacecraft the size of Manhattan that are going to go off to the stars and win an empire along the Milky Way, and that is our destiny, or whether we can go inward and you know, place our entire world in a single grain of sand and leave that grain of sand on an Indonesian beach somewhere and just retreat from the planet into some other dimension that we will create. You know, perhaps we can build a module and bury it on the moon and then radio transmit ourselves into its interstices and live in a simulacrum of a real world forever as a penance for what we did to the planet. I mean, the scenarios are endless because the cultural dimension that opens ahead of us is the imagination. That's what all this stuff is. That's where all these things are living. Uh, it's something that we have only a taste of. In terms of imagination, we are living in a one-dimensional world. But the curve, the curve of imagination's ingression into the world of human culture could take a sudden asymptote.